a good Bible. Um, number one, um, one point, not a three point lesson, sir, just one point. You're going to take one point and try to get across to me. They can carry away, a four-year-old can carry away one point. You keep his attention, you're driving one point home over and over and over and over. So if they're off in la-la land uh, and miss the second or third, they still got it, that one point. They just miss your application up along the way. Okay, let's, uh, <coughs> what, what are you going to preach on? I wrote a letter to Dr. Bob Jones, Sr. I said, Dr. Bob, I said, uh, I'm preaching. I said, what do you think is the most important subject to cover? And he wrote back. What do you think he said? Dr. Bob Jones, Sr. What? Now, he was an evangelist. They didn't say that. <laughs> he said, preach this. Preach on sin. <laughs> they need to get saved. They need to get right with God. Preach on sin. Over and over and over and over. He said, the people of the United States don't know what sin is. They don't know how to guard against it. And they need preaching on sin. So let's get one point about sin. What's a very important point about sin? All sin is against God. Okay, sin is any act of disobedience against God. Okay, what else? The corrupt both the body and soul. What? The corrupt both the body and soul. Okay, put it down simple for a four or five year old. What? It's bad for you? Sin's bad. Think you can get that point across? I put this one. Sin. Okay, so you take one point. You got a Bible verse for that? Sin hurts. Sin's wrong. Sin's damaging. You get a thought. You got a piece of paper? Turn it over or else I got some paper here you can use. I want you to make some sermons. Follow what I've got here, and then we're going to make some sermon. Draw your circle. One point, one subject. One subject. Um, and we're going to take this one point. And we're going to drive it home. Drive it home. Drive it home as many points as you can. Okay. So, uh, the definition. What's the definition of sin? Any act of disobedience against God. Simple. God says it. Hey, I don't do that. Okay. Uh, how else are you going to drive it home? Apply it. Okay, here. Um, Bible character. What Bible character really got hurt by sin? Samson. Who? Samson. Samson. Wow. He got disaster. <laughs> Who else? Adam. Saul. Adam. Saul. David. 
See, you got Bible characters just one after another, and you can simplify and bring it down. So here you got one point you're driving home. This is what sin is. That's what I'm talking about. This is a Bible character that didn't understand what I'm telling you, and they messed their life up. Um, what else? We're going to drive this home from every we possibly can. Jabez. Okay, you got, you got Job. Jabez asked the Lord to keep him from sin that it wouldn't harm, wouldn't hurt him. Okay. And God answered that prayer. Okay. Now, I want more now. We're going to go around this circle, and you can put a sermon together to preach the junior church in 15 minutes. So you take one point, you take your subject, and you, this is what you want to teach those kids. Sin hurts. And how does it hurt? Well, it hurt Bible character. What else? We got two things: a definition and a, a Bible character. To, to back it up. What else? Uh, who applies to? Who applies to? Okay, I, I'll say it this way: um, a personal experience. You can, you can bring somebody. He, he, Bring somebody that they know, somebody in Hollywood. They mess their life up. They got drunk driving, arrested and drunk driving. What a testimony. You know, they, they did something they shouldn't have done. It hurt them. Ruined their car. Gave them a lot of bad publicity. Um, you, you, okay, give me more. We're just, let's go around here. We're driving this point home. How God can fix it for you. How God what? How God can fix it for you. Like you have sin, but it's okay. Here, here's, here's, here you go. The cure. The cure. What do you do when you sin? Everybody sins. What are you going to do about it? John 1 9, 1 John 1 9. Okay, how about something other? Well, another illustration from uh, history. Hitler did something he shouldn't have done. Okay. And he got punished for it. He tried to kill all the Germans and all the rest of the world. Yeah, and the Jewish people no. tried to exterminate the Jewish people. Murder. Murder people. Murder. Up with some more. Slavery in our own country caused the civil war. Okay, that's history. How about uh, parallel verses? You got you got to have a you got to have a text. And you have parallel verses. See? Well, John said this, and Peter said this, and Paul said this, and David said this. See? So what you're doing, you're driving one point home over and over and over and over. Now, we, we can keep on going. I don't know how much time you can hold. Uh, I'm tired of sitting after a while, but this, this, is the, this is the acid test. This is really the core of, of what I can uh, show you today. Um, uh, Mark Lee is the author of this style of uh, preaching. He wrote a book on it called uh, Plain Talk. His book. But he said if you want to preach to young people, attention span, they're going to tune out half of this. They're thinking something else, you're getting distracted. But you got one point, you keep driving it home, over and over and over. And a very simple way to do it. You see that? So you have a method to sit down and put it together. Okay, now let's um, let's go to text. Let's, uh, we want we want a point. We want a, a verse or a text that would really be a dynamite verse 
to teach. You want them to memorize a verse? You get to memorize that, that verse. You can teach them to memorize. You write it out. You sound it out. You read it to them. You just... Give me Bible verses that would be great subjects to work on something like that. Bible verses. Well, uh, First Chronicles four nine, the prayer of Jabez and how God answered it. Okay. You got that? You take the notes on this. Huh? It's not in my notes. She gave you one. Another one. One verse. James 4, 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Look at that verse. Get your Bibles. Look at that verse. So you take your Bibles, you take a verse like this. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. What's the first thing you can say about that? Let, let, let's just pull things out of that verse. What can you know about it? Ten Commandments. It's simpler. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can know right from that's what God said. How do you know right from wrong? How can an unsaved person, an unsaved kid, know right from wrong? How? Come on, talk to me. Conscience. God has given everybody a conscience. And you don't have to tell somebody what sin is. They know it. See? So here's a verse that God says you can know what's right or wrong. It's not a big subject to handle. You know because God had put it here, written it in your heart through your conscience. You got another one? Another point out of this verse. Thy word have I given my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's a good verse. Now put that down for another one. Yeah, and this Psalm is Psalms 119. Psalms 119. Okay. Now we'll get we'll get to some of these if we can. Okay, Psalms. Uh, nine, nine through eleven. Wherewithal shall I cleanse his weight by taking heed thereto according to the word of God. Okay, my word by his mouth. We're back to James 1 or 4 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. What do you mean, doeth it not? What does that mean? Sin's a choice. A choice. Okay, a choice, but there's something more. Here's a thought, you got it? Christianity is the only religion of all religions that holds you accountable for not doing something. What? I can know right from wrong, and if I don't do right, it's sin. That's my way of saying it. You can say it your way, I mean, but see, You've got to do right. 
<laughs> you got to know it, and then you got to do it. That, that's a, one of the biggest words in the dictionary. Do. <laughs> do right. <laughs> it's hard to do right. It's the hardest thing to do. It's easier to do wrong. He found one too. Where is it at? Psalm 106, verse 3. What does it say? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Very good. Psalms and Proverbs are full of these. Okay? So you know something, do something. What else? Dig something out of this first. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do some digging here. What else? Is that all you see in that verse? Well, there's a concept of individual responsibility for actions here. You know, what I do or do not do is my own fault, not, you know, my circumstances, environment. That's right. Influences what I do, I'm responsible for. Responsibility. Um, Responsibility, accountability would be another word. Okay. Now, you, you get some of these verses, and when a preacher preaches on something, you say, oh, listen, that's a great verse. Put it in, in your Bible someplace on those white blank pages. That's what they're there for. <laughs> Take notes and uh, fill them up and with these kind of verses. And you sit down with a verse like that, and you can start digging this one-point message or out of the, out of a verse, you could dig all kinds of things up. Um, be sure your sins will find you out. Wow, in numbers, that's a you put it in context and you get a different twist than a lot of preachers have preached it. Okay, um, but be sure your sins will find you. Out. Sin hurts. Sin, uh, right here, you you know you do. You're responsible for uh, sin. That's, that's a good one. Um, you can work on that from memory. I had a youth pastor when I was a kid. My youth pastor lied about his age when he was 17. And he joined the Navy. He got in the service, and because he was so young, he wanted the respect and the attention of the older guys that had been in the service. You know what he did? He picked up a bad mouth. And he got jokes. You name a subject and he can put a joke with it. He gets together talking with the guys on break and whatever in the service. And talking about guys, whatever, whatever subject comes up, he had a joke. He had a dirty joke about it. And he made himself popular by telling jokes, dirty jokes. Then he got saved. And I, I asked him one day, I said, you know, you started out and you programmed your mind to remember all this garbage. I said, hasn't that been a terrible nightmare and hurdle for you to get rid of out of your life? I said, how did you do it? How'd you get a bad habit out of your life? You know what he said? You memorize scripture. Mm -hmm. You push it out. <laughs> push that garbage out by pushing new stuff in. And he said, somebody somebody comes along and they tell a story about this, and oh, that's a I got a good joke, but I can't tell it. But I got a new joke. I got a good joke. I got a good verse, whatever. But he programmed his mind. That's another good verse. And there's there's all kind, any other verses uh, you can think of that are just powerful verses, one verse that says a, a whole bunch of things. Okay, I'm going to give you, an hour and a half here, I'm going to give you a couple simple sermons that you can pull out of your sleeve. Ever, ever come to church and say, so-and-so is sick today, and they want you to take over for them? Teach Sunday school? <laughs> Did you ever have that happen to you? What do you do? 
you better, you better be able to pull something out. So I'm going to give you something to pull out and uh, let you work on it. But everybody's got to have something up their sleeve or in the pages of their Bible. Take your notes and put them in the pages of your Bible. I'm going to give you a couple simple messages that uh, just help. Alex called me up. I don't know where you were, Alex. South America? Where were you? Yes. You're in South America. And he said, what was that sermon outline you gave? <laughs> I'm going to give it to all these people so they can know. So, uh, One book. what? One book. Yeah, there you go. Uh, here's the thing. You get thrown into a class. Put this in, in the white pages of your Bible. Here's, here's a sermon uh, for salvation. Salvation sermon. What do you have to do to get saved? What do you have to do to get saved? Simple. Three things. Three things. Turn your Bible to 1 John. Chapter 5. Right from the Bible, teaching the Bible. Salvation message. Three things you have to do to get saved, and you six-year-olds can understand this. Okay? I want to get saved. I'm really concerned. I want to go to heaven when I die. I don't want to miss out on heaven. So I want to, I want to get saved. There's three things I have to do. The first thing I have to realize, there's only one place that tells me how to get saved with authority and confidence. It's not the World Book Encyclopedia. It's not the dictionary. It's the what? It's the Bible. So there's only one place to really go with certainty. If you want to get saved, go to heaven. Only one book to go to. It speaks with authority. And you can take them to the passage and they can mark it. I'm in 1 John chapter chapter uh, 5. 1 John 5. Starting in verse 11. And this, what's this? It's right here in my hand. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. So there you go. There's the Bible. The Bible is the book with authority. And when people want to know how to get to heaven for sure, they go to the Bible. If you would go forward in a church service and say, I want to be saved, they open their Bible and they show you from the Bible how to get saved. So there's only one book, and that's the Bible. Two, there's only one Savior. And that's Christ. Can you spell Christ like that? It's scribble. That's what I do with my notes. I can't read my notes sometimes because <laughs> I scribble them out in a hurry. Okay. So there's three things. There's only one book. There's only one Savior. How do you know that? Because he said that. Look at the next uh, part of the verse. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. It's not in doing good. It's not in joining a church. It's not in being baptized. You've got to focus. Salvation's got to be in the person of Jesus Christ. Only. See? John 14, 6. I am the way. I am the truth. See? Jesus said, I am the one. All right? Simple. You need to elaborate and illustrate. Third thing. Um, let, let's emphasize what the text emphasizes. Uh, verse 12, he that hath the Son hath life. That's eternal life. 
and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It's very simple, very plain. It's there in the text. You don't have to have a college degree to, to teach that. Okay? Now, what's the third thing? You have to have this to get saved. That's part of it. See, you've got to know that you're a sinner mm -hmm. and you need to be saved. Mm -hmm. You can't lead a child to the Lord that doesn't know that he's a sinner. Um, otherwise, you pick some unripe fruit. You've got to know, why do I need to be saved? Because I'm not good enough to go to heaven. Because I'm mis displeasing to God. I've wronged God. How do you get that taken care of? Well, I have to confess my sin to him. See, I have to put my faith in him. The Bible tells me how to do that. Put my faith in him. So I say this. Um, only one time do you really need to be saved. What is that time? Um, the time is when you call upon the Lord. Uh, Romans 10, 13, what? It says what? Whosoever shall, call upon Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you think back, was there a time when you called upon God to save you? Knew that you were a sinner, knew that you needed to get saved before you could go to heaven and, and live with angels and look God in the face. Was there a time when you really felt a burden for sin and you called upon God to save you? What time was that? What year was that? What place was that? Romans uh, 10, 13. And it's in the text. Verse 13. And these things have we written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. You might know it. Well, when do you know it? Well, it's the time that I called. It's the time that I really meant business and I prayed and asked God to save me. Now, you, you can illustrate that. You can put other verses with it. But there is a simple little outline that you, a drop of a hat, you, you can just bring out and uh, use uh, on salvation. Simple? Okay? Tuck that in the pages of your Bible and uh, pull that out sometime. Um, you still with me or are you tired? I want to help. I don't want to just wear you out. Some people can only endure as much as they can sit. Okay, I'm going to give you another one. Another one you can develop for teaching children how to be saved. I went through the Bible and I found out it's not hard to get saved. God's made it very easy to get saved. Um, how easy is it to get saved? So I came to the place where I went through the Bible and I looked for illustrations of salvation. So I'm talking to young kids, illustrating something that God just illustrates himself. So I know it's an inspired illustration. It's an illustration that the Holy Spirit can use to get a hold of hearts and lives. And uh, uh, let's go to Revelation 3.20. What is that? This is illustrations of salvation. That's the title. Revelation 3.20. What, what's that say? Behold, I stand before him, and I open the door, 
Okay? Jesus stands at the door. What door? The heart door. Jesus stands on the door. There's a famous picture of that. You might even want to get a picture of that and bring it to place. Jesus knocking on the door. Very interesting door. There's no hinges on it. It opens from the inside. Uh, I stand at the door and knock. What do you have to do to get saved? Open the door. Open the door of your heart. That's all you have to do. Is that hard? A five-year-old can do that. Open the heart door. You want Jesus to come into your life and save you? You want to have forgiveness of your sins? All you have to do is open the door of your heart to do that. See that? That's an illustration. So it's a door. It's a door illustration. Um, here's a good one. Another illustration. Um, Hebrews 12, verse 2. Get this. Charles Spurgeon was raised by his grandfather, a Baptist preacher. And Charles Spurgeon was 12 years old, and he wrestled with whether he was saved or not. He wanted to be saved, but he never had the assurance that he was saved. He wrestled with that. That was a big problem to him. So other people testified of that church. His grandfather preached on it, but he, he just didn't know for sure. Twelve years old. One day, Saturday night, it snowed and snowed and snowed. And Sunday morning when they woke up, there was so much snow, people couldn't get out of their houses down the streets to the churches. And Spurgeon said, I'm going to go to church trouble. I want to know I'm safe. He got out in the street and there's so much snow that he couldn't make it to his church. But there was a church on the way, a Methodist church, that there was a light on and the door was shoveled out and he said he stopped at that Methodist church for the message. And he said the preacher didn't get there. There was no preacher there, but there was a deacon there. And the deacon got up in the pulpit and preached this. See the text? What's it say? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Just a few first few words. Looking unto Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of faith. The, the, the deacon looked right at Spurgeon, because there's hardly anybody there, pointed to Spurgeon, and he said, Son, if you look to Jesus, he'll save you. He said, Don't look to me. Don't look to the church. Don't look to what you're doing for him. Look to Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of your faith. Put your faith in him. Spurgeon got saved that morning just by looking to Jesus. Oh. That's an illustration. Looking. Anybody can look. That's not hard to do. That's a Bible illustration. Um, here's another one. Uh, Romans 10.13. Call upon the Lord. Anybody can call upon the Lord. It's not, you don't have to call loud. You don't have to call far off. It's an illustration of salvation. And depending on the time of your class and the interest, you'll keep changing these all, all along. Um, John 3.16, For God so gave His only begotten Son. 
It's as easy as a gift. Okay? God says salvation is a gift. It's free. All you have to do is take it. That's an inspired illustration of salvation. Um, there's a woman of the well who said, if you will drink, I have the my, I, my words, the water of life. It'll give you eternal life if you listen to what I'm saying to you. All you have to do is drink. It's as easy as taking a drink is to understand how to be saved. And Jesus said, uh, I'm the bread of life. He that eateth shall have eternal life. It's as easy as eating. We do it every day. So these are just simple illustrations of uh, being saved that are inspired in the Word of God and have some real potency to them. All right? Um, how, are we, how are we doing? Are you getting help? Uh, any questions you want to ask? No questions. That's a bad sign. <laughs> There's no question. Um, what 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 have you found to help so far? What have you found? Well, I thought of the man on the cross that got saved. Excellent passage. You gave me the idea. Yeah, couldn't do anything. Couldn't get off. He would have gotten. He would have got baptized, but he couldn't get off the cross. <laughs> See, he would have asked forgiveness, went around these people and corrected things, gave their money back. He couldn't and get off the cross. Don't today. have to do that. You don't have to. Just put your faith. That's that's good. That's a good illustration. Uh, anybody else? What did you get? What did you get? Uh, wow. Oh, when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which is the world. Okay. What did you get out of today? So, in your one point for a lesson, like, would you string any of your lessons together? You can do whatever you're creative enough to do. <laughs> See? They, they, they give teachers some suggestions, but some teachers do it better than the suggestions. I mean, they just run with it. See? One, we, one point we didn't put on that circle uh, about sin, you can put the devil. See? The devil wants you to sin. See? The devil wants to ruin you. That's why he wants you to sin. He wants to ruin Christians. And uh, so there's so many things that you can add to one point, but you just keep driving that point home, and usually they'll carry it away. They'll remember it. And if you really want to get going, you dramatic do it. You do it dramatically. Oh, another one I thought of was the one you were talking about, the effect of sin was the radical son. And when you're talking about being under the umbrella of your parents. And, uh, Isn't that a good illustration? Yeah. I mean, he went away from home. He said, I want my money. I want it now. My inheritance. Mm -hmm. I'm going to. And what did he do? No experience. Yep. So he blew it. He found himself worse off. Mm -hmm. So he got back under the umbrella. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the best thing to do. Get back mm -hmm. under the umbrella. That's a good point. Yes. In what? <laughs> Ryrie, Charles Ryrie from Dallas, has a book on illustrations for junior church. And he has some fantastic illustrations in there. Just simple things you can bring. You know, cups and water and, and uh, uh, but, but just, just object lessons. And attention, see, you're breaking it up from talking to doing, and it shows an illustration. Um, I've used um, glasses of water. I put a glass of water in. I said, This is so and so. And I said, uh, He did something he shouldn't have done. He disobeyed, and he got sin in his life. And I put some ink in the water and stirred it. And say he's not the same anymore. How do we clean his life up? 
and then I, I got some bleach, <laughs> and I put it in there. <laughs> See, it comes the word of God, it cleanses you. First John 1, 9, 5, 1, 7, cleanses you. And I stirred it, and it went away. And it's, you know, it's simple little illustrations that, that you can use, but they're good. Yes? Yeah, and you can teach them uh, how Jesus, he uh, created our taste buds so we eat, and you can have the lesson on the feeding of the 5,000 and bring bread and fish for them to eat and get a lesson. Somebody, my wife or somebody, had a fish cookie cutter, and she cut it out of bread and gave everybody a fish. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just... <laughs> what, however creative you can get, the better. You were going to say something, Chris? Yeah, well, one thing I found helpful is you talked about um, having a vision of where your students are going to go. That's helpful to develop in that. Uh, and you can evaluate yourself. Yeah, that too is, yeah, helpful to see what, what are we actually accomplishing versus not accomplishing. Right. And uh, you can have events happen in junior church. Surprises, you know. Uh, we put uh, prizes under the seats, and uh, we did all kinds of things. Had had visitors come, yes, like a Bible character. They came, and they put a robe on him, you know, and come in there. And he says, this is so and so. He's talked about in this book, and and you can ask him questions. <laughs> They remember stuff like that. But you just have to go out of the way and knock yourself out. Okay, anything else? Uh, <laughs> get to that one, get there anyway, but like, I didn't realize that what you mentioned that the attention spans almost match the age. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's easy to, well, at least for me, it's easy to forget that. One of the things your preacher's going to have to do is people work all night. <laughs> and they come here. <laughs> and you got to keep them awake. Now, the question is, <laughs> in, in seminary, we had guys that had night jobs, and they come to school in the daytime, and then they uh, work nights. Mm -hmm. Most of us had night jobs. And uh, they go to sleep. And we, <laughs> one professor said, let them sleep. They need to sleep more than they need my lecture. <laughs> uh, just, it's life. <laughs> that's, that's life. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I'll tell you what, it's almost two hours. Uh, if you want to go over anything or we can work on things together, whatever. But uh, tomorrow I have some messages for you that are deep, especially tomorrow night. Um, I just, uh, you don't hear much preaching on problems in life. And I'm going to go into some of the problems in life and why. Why there's really problems. And show you from the Bible. Uh, I'll go as far as I can. But bring your Bibles and uh, get a nap and uh, be ready to listen. Okay? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these folks that have come and stopped their activities or responsibilities and Lord, been with us today. Lord, I pray that there's something here that they can carry away and be a help to them and to those that they teach. And Lord, that their lives might rub off on those kids. And Lord, bless them for it. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay. Dismissed. <laughs>